Well, good afternoon, everybody, and how wonderful to see people here on time. It's not even the Cambridge Five past the hour yet. Um, my name is Pippa Rogerson. I'm a professor here in the law faculty in private international law. I've also been true Cambridge through and through. I was an undergraduate at Newnham. I then had three years at what was then CAD Chance and came back to do a PhD at Keyes, where I've stayed ever since, and I'm now, for my sins, master. But it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome you all to this third Cambridge Women in the Law event. The first one in 2019, in person, huge success. The second in 2021, had to be online, and it is really lovely to see us all back here in person now. There are lots of people who've been involved in the three events and in this one, and I won't name them, but thank you all very much for working so hard on it. We really have a fantastic afternoon uh, this afternoon. First of all, we have Dame Vivian Rose in conversation. Then there will be time for tea and more discussion of what's been raised. And then we will return for uh, a panel event on AI and law, The Road Ahead. Now, that event particularly shows the breadth and depth, I think, of what is going on in the law faculty and in the world and how central legal academics can be to the most important work that is also being done by Ruth Ward as the Director of Knowledge at the Government Legal Department, by uh, Catherine Apps at the bar at Essex Street, I have to say Essex Street, not Essex Court in case I get confused, and um, by Imogen Island at Hogan Lovells being joined by Dr. Emilia Leinart of the Cambridge Law Faculty. It is bringing women together absolutely at the centre of what's going on and important Cambridge Women in Law originally in 2019 was celebrating 100 years from the Sex Discrimination Act of 1919, uh, the Sex Anti-Discrimination Act, maybe, of 1919, and here we are 104 years later, and this is still a very important topic. Everybody's welcome, but this is the Cambridge Women in Law event. Now, this is where I have to do my air hostess impression. Um, we're not expecting a... Um, fire alarm today, so if it happens, it will be something that we have to follow. The exits are uh, down the front, and then when you get out, turn left, is the quickest way out of the building in an emergency, or the two exits at the back, you can go up and back, left up the way you came in. Uh, but as I said, this way is the quickest end of uh, air hostess impression. So raising the tone, I hope, a bit. It is my honor to introduce Dame Vivian Rose, Lady Rose, or as I remember her from my time at Newnham Viv. Uh, thank you so much for coming along to talk to us this afternoon, and I'll try and be appropriately deferential from here on. Uh, Lady Rose is currently the sole woman on the Supreme Court, although following some other notable Cambridge Law Faculty women graduates. Indeed, people who contributed both to the first and second events of Cambridge Women in Law, Dame Brenda Hale and Dame Mary Arden. And I seem to remember Eilish Ferrin, professor of this faculty, remarking at the time of 2019, which was famously spider brooch occasion, Oxford can keep its numerous prime ministers. We in Cambridge are much more proud of our dominance in women members of the Supreme Court. So, Lady Rose, your path to the Supreme Court has not followed the usual straight ladder. Cambridge, well, via Oxford, uh, the Bar, High Court, Court of Appeal, and S Supreme Court, there have been some absolutely fascinating diversions and civil and dedicated service, which I hope we will hear more detail about uh, in your conversation with Sarah. You do. You were a civil servant at the Treasury, and I remember very interestingly at the MOD, you were seconded to the Council of the Speaker of the House of Commons before becoming Chairman of the Competition Appeal Tribunal, and hence on to High Judicial Office. So I am very much looking forward to hearing uh, about that. I also introduce Professor Dame Sarah Worthington, who will be leading the conversation for us this afternoon. Sarah, until recently, was the Downing Professor of English Law, the Laws of England. Uh, she's a Fellow of Trinity. Uh, she came to Cambridge originally to do her PhD with Len Seeley, which is the first time uh, I met her, but then went on to uh, LSE after a stint at Birkbeck. 
She was pro-director at LSE and was awarded a DBE in 2020 for her services to private law. Along with being an academic, Sarah has been very involved in the British Academy, uh, the British Museum, the London Business School, and is a venture at Middle. So we have some remarkable women here. I'm very much looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Pippa. Uh, that was a lovely introduction for both of us. Uh, this really is a conversation. We have an hour, uh, and I hope that uh, for the first part of it, I can ask the sorts of questions that you might ask uh, Vivian, Lady Rose. And uh, then at the end, you've got a chance to fill in the gaps, ask the questions that I didn't ask. And what I want to do is start with the Supreme Court uh, and go in a loop. Uh, where we touch on the, some of the high points in Vivian's life uh, and then return to the Supreme Court. So, starting with the Supreme Court, um, the day that you were sworn in. Go back to that day. So, we see photographs of people dressed up in all these, this magnificent clobber, as my kids would say. <laughs> um, What's your most distinctive memory of that day? It was, it was a wonderful day. It was in April 2021, so we were just coming out of lockdown. Um, and uh, I couldn't have a lot of people there because there was still a lot of social distancing, so I had to choose five guests only. So we were... But it, it was lovely because it was the first opportunity that my 11 colleagues had had all to be in the same place mm -hmm. since Lord Stevens had been sworn in the previous October because everyone had been sitting remotely as I had from um, my dining room table or what I call court number one at the Golders <laughs> Green Civic Justice Center. Um, and so it was, it was great just to be in town in the court and it, it was a very moving moment. I find the, the judicial oaths, whenever you take up any judicial office, you swear the oath of allegiance uh, to the monarch and also the judicial oath. And it's, uh, it's one of, I'm sure it's not as old as it purports to be. It's a sort of slight Victoriana thing, but I find it very moving. Uh, and it was a, it was a, a wonderful occasion um, and uh, not lovely. Uh, some of the justices, of course, I knew very well, having grown up with them, as it were, in the High Court and the Court of Appeal. Of course, I didn't know the two Scots judges. I didn't know Lord Stevens. Um, now I know them very well. Uh, but it was a wonderful day. And I also specifically asked if I could go and have my photograph taken in Parliament Square by Millicent Garrett Fawcett, who, of course, one of the founders of... Um, of Newman College, and I very much value that photograph of me in my clobber, as you put it, <laughs> standing next to her. If you, if you haven't seen that photograph, it is on the Newnham website, uh, and it's the only photograph I've seen of a Supreme Court justice in dressed up other than for the start of the legal year. Um, so I don't know whether you're the only person who managed to persuade a photographer <laughs> well, I thought, to come outside. Well, I'll <laughs> ask. They can only say no. Of course, it depended on what the weather was going to be like. But no, they were, they were happy for me to do it. Oh. So it was a wonderful moment. It is a wonderful photo. Mm -hmm. um, and Lady Rose, Lazy Ro Lady Rose of Colmworth. Yes. What's the significance of well, that? Well, Colmworth is a little village uh, just near St. Neot, so not very far from here. When you're appointed to be a Justice of the Supreme Court, I'm not a I don't actually get to join the uh, House of Lords as the um, members of the Apex Court did when they were a committee of the House of Lords. So uh, Lady Hale is a real baroness. I'm not a real baroness. It's a courtesy title, but nonetheless, one of the first things I had to do was get in touch with the head of the College of Arms, the Garter Principal King of Arms, and it is he who can tell me whether I can just be Lady Rose or whether I have to be Lady Rose of somewhere, and that depends on whether there's another or has been another Lady Rose. 
So there is another Lady Rose, has been another Lady Rose. Where, where can I be of? I said, well, what kind of place? To which he replied, this is all by email. It has to be a, a village or town that supports a barony. Well, I didn't find that particularly <laughs> helpful. <laughs> but I said, well, what about Colmworth? Adding, it's in the Doomsday Book. I thought, let's <laughs> see if that cuts any mustard. <laughs> anyway, apparently Colmworth was fine, so I'm Lady Rose of Colmworth. <laughs> and that is where you live? Yeah, we have a... a I mostly live in London, but we have a weekend. Ah, so so it's, it's home and it's... It, it supports a barony. It does support a barony, yeah. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't realise that extra requirement. Uh, that's, that's news. Um, so now I want to go back to your early life. Um, when I first met Vivian, uh, she, was, uh, it was, she was in the High Court and I had been appointed as a Deputy High Court Judge and she was appointed as my mentor. That was how I met Vivian. Uh, and I had a six-year term, which I finished earlier this year, and by the time I finished my six-year term, Vivian had been on the Supreme Court for two years. So this rise from the High Court to the Supreme Court was meteoric. Uh, I was very sad when she left, and I had lost my mentor. Um, but what I want to do is go right back to the beginning and see if there were any hints or inklings that... This was the trajectory. <laughs> so, so can we start with where you were born and parents, siblings, you know, what were the life lessons that... Yes, uh, I've, I've always been a Londoner. I haven't really flown very far from the nest. I've always lived in North London. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents were both graduates. My father was a refugee from Germany just before the war and my mother was in, lived in Manchester. And they came down to London. My father worked for Marks and Spencers all his career. Mm -hmm. So there were no lawyers in the family. I'm the middle of three girls. Um, and uh, I went to the local comprehensive school, Kingsbury High School in North London. And I was very happy there. And it's a very good school, still is a very good school, very dedicated staff. And I always knew from the age of about 14 that I wanted to be a lawyer. I don't know where the idea came from, um, but I, I was always clear that I wanted to go to the bar. Um, and I sort of followed quite a clear trajectory to do that. I read law here. Maybe if I'd known I was going to spend the whole of the rest of my life as a lawyer, <laughs> I might have come to it a little bit later. But I did enjoy law as an academic subject, um, and I did enjoy school. Um, uh, and it was, a, it was a family that placed a lot of emphasis on study and scholarship. Mm -hmm. My father had been um, at the LSE uh, as a student and they'd been evacuated to Cambridge. He'd been oh. at Peterhouse during the war. Mm -hmm. So we had a Cambridge connection and we used to come up and punt on the river every, every Easter. Um, so there was no doubt if I had the ability which I would aim for, so I, I came up to Newnham. And you had to choose Newnham? Yes, I'm and not this has this, quite, yes, this Millicent not, Garrett Fawcett well, link. It, so I'm not quite, I'm mm. not sure. At that time, Newnham didn't have its own director of studies. Uh, I was taught by Len Seeley and by Tony Smith. Um, and they were our director of studies. And law was a very small, there were only four of us in the first year lawyers. Um, in my year. Uh, in my second year, then we did get a, a director of studies, Sally Woodward, and then the, the, um, the number of lawyers at Newnham expanded a bit. But it was good in that we, in the first year, we were sort of farmed out everywhere because we didn't have any Newnham law faculty. So we tended to be farmed out to specialists in whatever topic mm. we wanted to do. So I think we actually got a very good deal. And got to know more people. I and yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. And then, and then you went to Oxford. So, so I have two questions here. <laughs> yeah. um, one is obvious, <laughs> why Oxford? But the other is, why a postgraduate degree? I mean, it, it yes, surely wasn't it necessary. Wasn't, no, it certainly wasn't necessary. Um, I was sort of wasn't sure whether I might have an academic 
life, but it wasn't really for me. How I ended up in Oxford was, was really coincidence. I was all planning to stay on here, although the, the postgraduate year was much more limited in terms of topics then. It was primarily international law, which wasn't something I was particularly interested in. But I happened to have a chat with Richard Fentiman, mm -hmm. who in, was, had just arrived at Queen's in his first teaching post and was teaching me conflicts of laws. Um, and I bumped into him and said, you know, I'm not sure about uh, what topics to choose. And he said, well, have you thought of going to do the BCL at Oxford, which I really hadn't. Um, anyway, he got busy and uh, I ended up going to Brazenose for that year. And in fact, it was one of those odd things that turned out to be very influential in the rest of my life because I made very good friends there who are still some of my closest friends. And that was where I first studied competition law, which then ended up being my specialism when I was in practice and then my first judicial post. So having been a rather haphazard choice, in fact, it was, it was a, a very lucky choice. Mm. That's interesting. Um, I could ask you, I suppose, who were the influential teachers beyond doing mm. competition law, but, but I don't really want to ask you that. I want to <laughs> ask you, um, knowing what you know now, when you look back on that undergraduate period and the postgraduate period, what do you think we could do more of and less of with our students now? I think what was really great about the course here, which was rather different, as I understand it, from the Oxford Jurisprudence undergraduate course, was that um, everybody went to all the lectures. And that was a great thing because it got you out of the college, you met your kind of cohort of lawyers, you got the basics dinned into your head of each topic. Mm. Um, and I think, I think that the undergraduate course appealed to me particularly because I do have a very practical rather than theoretical mind and approach to legal issues. And some of my colleagues on the Supreme Court have a much more academic approach to things and much more drawing out the principles. I, I've always seen law as a way of facilitating people to do what they want to do and problem solving. Mm. So I think that the Cambridge undergraduate course suited me um, for that. But whether it would suit someone equally who did have the more sort of philosophical approach to things, I'm, I'm not quite sure. But it was good, it was it was good, good for me, you. yes. So you then went to the bar. Yes. And you said when you were talking about being at school that you knew from the beginning you wanted to be a barrister. I know from years and years of teaching, quite a lot of students worry about that choice and they're not quite clear how to make it because being at university is quite different yes. from doing either of those things. Um, why were you so sure? Uh, I, I wanted, I thought I would enjoy the sort of per performative part of it. In fact, I didn't, and that was why I left after <laughs> 10 years. But um, I, I think that there were then quite a lot of prejudices against the soliciting, solicitoring branch of the profession as not being as intellectually rigorous or demanding or as interesting. I don't think, in fact, that that's true, but that was the sort of the perception. Yes. And there was also, that was really at the time, all that was on offer. You either applied to one of the magic circle firms or you went to the bar. I think that one of the things I've learned in my career and also one of the things I try and emphasize when I speak as I do to students, whether they're sixth formers or university students, is actually there is so much more out there uh, as a legal career than just those two options. But it was, it was quite limited in those days. And of those two, I preferred the idea of going to the bar, even though I realise now I didn't have 
much idea of what it was actually going to be like. And the bar is very different depending on whether you go into the criminal bar side of things or the commercial side of things. And I went towards the commercial side, which was the right choice for me. Mm. So, so I suppose one of the lessons is that you were brave enough to leave. I imagine that quite a lot of people um, head down a particular route and, and they've gone so far. You said mm. you were there for a decade. Mm. They've gone so far that it's quite hard to say, I'm going to jump off. Yes, and it was, it was very, it was more surprising in those days. I think careers have become much more fluid and people do move. But in those days at the bar, if somebody wanted to move to a different set of chambers, <laughs> everyone would think, my goodness, what could possibly have happened? Or a different law firm. It was a sign that something must have gone very seriously wrong. Um, so it, it took me a while. I, I very much enjoyed being a barrister as much as I did it. Um, because when I had something quite difficult to do in court, I, they would appoint a more senior QC, as they were then, uh, to lead me, and I didn't actually have to do the court bit. But I realized that I really didn't enjoy being in court, and that's quite a disadvantage if you're a <laughs> rising barrister, let's face it. Um, I got very, very nervous beforehand, and, I, and nobody talked about these things in those days. And when I... And I was always quite open, you know, people said, why are you leaving? Because I was, I was making a good living at it. And I said, well, I find it very stressful. I get very nervous beforehand. And, and they said, yes, well, so do I. But, uh, but I did obviously wasn't getting the compensating buzz that they were getting from actually mm -hmm. doing the job. And the last case I did was with the late and much missed Ginevra Cause, who was a wonderful barrister, a delightful woman, and one of the few really successful, at that time, really successful commercial silks. And I remember, I remember this so clearly sitting there, and I, you know, when I met her, oh, that's what I'm going to be like, Just she's my role model. And then I remember sitting there and saying, well, you know, what have you got coming up in the term ahead? And she, oh, she was going up to Manchester to do this three-day trial and this hearing. And I remember sitting there thinking, I would be completely wretched if that's what the next few months held in store for me, but that is where I am heading. And if I don't want to get there, I better switch. Change direction. So then what was I going to do? Would I give up the law completely and do something completely different? And I had some good careers advice, which is don't give up the law. You obviously really like the law. You've invested a lot of time and energy into it. It's being a barrister you don't like. Um, and um, I joined the government legal service, which was uh, in a working always in an advisory capacity. Um, so I, I missed, I avoided the whole stressful litigation side of things. Yes. Well, I, I want you to say more about the government <laughs> legal service because uh, I, I don't know if you had the same reaction as me, but. Part of me thinks, well, probably not a lot of law, a lot more policy and a lot more constraints on what you can do because it depends who's in government and what their um, you know, trajectory is or the route they're on. And yet, um, I've only made a note of three areas. So you were in Treasury doing drafting and then you were in the Ministry of Defence, which Pippa mentioned, which sounds absolutely fascinating. And then counsel to the Speaker, which also sounds absolutely fascinating. Mm. Um, and who knew that the government <laughs> legal service could be quite so interesting? Yes, it, I mean, so. I think a lot of, as a barrister, I'd done work for public bodies um, and had been instructed by Treasury solicitors, but I hadn't realized that there was this whole other, thousands of them now, I think, um, government lawyers all working away in the individual departments advising the department on whatever it is they want to do and when you realize it you think oh well yes of course they of course, must exist yeah. but um, uh, and it and it's it is very interesting there is a lot of legal content to it and in fact I think you get a lot more responsibility at a much more junior level than you would in a big city firm. 
Um, and you also, one of, the, one of the great selling points of the government legal service is that you do get every three, four years to move to do something completely different because they recognize what I think a lot of lawyers in private practice don't recognize, which is that legal skills are actually generic. They're not tied to any particular legal topic. Mm. Um, so if you can read legislation, if you can read case law, if you can read EU regulations and directives, you have a rough idea in your mind what the answer is likely to be. And you can apply those skills of fact gathering, sorting through what's relevant, what's irrelevant to any, any topic. And the government recognizes that, I think, far more than private practice does. And actually, it's a very good training for being a judge, because when you're a judge, every day, practically, it's a different legal topic, particularly in my work at the moment. I mean, it is literally anything. Yes. Um, and in, in, the, uh, in the skills list that they have for the judiciary, it all, it's always there. You have to demonstrate the ability to get to grips with a new area of law quite quickly. And for someone who's just worked in the pensions department of wherever or in criminal law or whatever for the whole of their career, they find that much more frightening a prospect than, mm. than I did because I did work for five years in um, financial services in the Treasury, and that I, was, I joined the government legal service right at the beginning of 96, so we had a year and a bit of the sort of tail end of the John Major administration where they couldn't really do anything because they didn't have a big parliamentary majority. Then in May 97, of course, in comes New Labour, and they wanted completely to revise the whole system for regulating insurance, financial services, and banking. And we had this mega act, which became the Financial Services and Markets Act. And I was on the bill team for that. And there is kind of policy involved in that you sit with the policy people and you work out from the very mega strategy overview right down to the very detailed level of, of what's got to be in the bill. Mm. Um, because part of my role was then not only advising the policy people and putting up briefing to ministers to take all the myriad decisions that there are, but then drafting the thousands of pages of instructions to parliamentary council or actually prepare the clauses, seeing whether what comes back works, piloting it through the House of Lords and the House of Commons. I mean, it's a, it was a fascinating, fascinating exercise. And then, off I went to the Ministry of Defence, really completely different. I joined the Ministry of Defence at the beginning of 2002, so just after the main uh, hostilities in Afghanistan. And of course it became clear quite soon that there was going to be another war in Iraq, and so it was sort of preparing for that. So absolutely completely different, completely different area of the law. Um, but you, you just apply the same skills that you've, you've picked up along the way. Yeah. Fascinating, absolutely <laughs> fascinating. I'm sure there'll be some more questions on that. But you're in the middle of this fascinating mix, mm. and then you decide you'll do something else. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so how did that happen? What, that, what? You know, you're, you're happily it, in this yes, interesting Yes, I was career, very happy in the And do you think you'll go and be a job? The difficulty with... I mean, I'd always had in, in mind when I was a barrister that I would like to be a judge. But when I left practice um, at the private bar, that, I thought, meant I would never be a judge. Because in 1995-96, all judges from the senior judiciary were drawn from senior silks. And that was my one big regret, actually, of leaving practice. And I thought I was saying to myself, well, am I really prepared to stick this out as a barrister, knowing that I'll be actually quite miserable for another 10, 12, 15 years in the hope that someone will tap my shoulder and say, would I like to be a high court judge? And I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. So when I joined the legal service, I thought I'd said goodbye to that. But then 
in the early 2000s, there was a complete revolution in how judges are appointed. The Judicial Appointments Commission was set up. It was no longer the sort of tap on the shoulder system. It was all open um, competition. And the pool from which judges were drawn was also uh, widened. And the then Treasury Solicitor, Dame Juliet Weldon, she fought very hard for employed lawyers and government lawyers to be able to uh, to be able to uh, eligible for judicial appointment. And as soon as I heard that, I thought, well, right. So what do I need to do? And it was also that I'd got to a level, I'd got to be a grade five uh, lawyer, and I really enjoyed that. But I was aware that at the levels above that the legal content of the civil service job is reducing and it's a lot more management and strategy. And lots of lawyers really love that, but I didn't feel that was for me. I wanted to keep primarily legal content. So I went to see Juliet Weldon and I said, look, you know, now it's all opened up. I really mm. think I'd like to aim to be a high court judge. And she said, well, we will support you. And it took me, then I was a grade five lawyer in the Ministry of Defense. It's not a very good jumping off point. So it took me eight years of quite careful planning to get myself into a position to apply for the High Court bench. So that involved getting a part-time judicial appointment because most full-time judges have already, almost all, have already done some part-time judicial work as, as you did. And that gives you a chance to see whether you like it, whether you're any good at it. Um, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll look for a post, which is something I know about, which was competition law, which mm. I had done, specialized in when I was a barrister in private practice. So I applied for the competition appeal tribunal, and that was my first judicial post. So when I went to work in the House of Commons in the Office of Counsel for the Speaker, that was three days a week. So I moved to work part-time in the government, and then I did two days a week in the tribunal, and I did those for a couple of years, three years, I think, until I was sure that the judicial side was what I wanted, and then I left the civil service. And re recall in the criminal court? Yes, yeah, so when I, once I'd decided that that was what I was, how I wasn't gonna go back into the civil service, I then started applying for other judicial posts, because the good thing about judicial work is that you usually get your first job in something that you know a bit about, but once you've got um, some judging under your belt, then you can move across to do judging pretty much anywhere. So I became, a, I joined the charity tribunal and the environment tribunal, and then I applied to be a recorder in the criminal court. And that used to be the sort of traditional first rung of the judicial ladder for people who were going up to the high court. But all these rungs that all kind of, nobody knew now under the new dispensation what you actually needed to do. So it was all kind of a little bit random, but I thought, well, I'll try and be a recorder. Um, partly because I thought, I, having been a lawyer all my career, um, I don't really want to get to the end of the career and not have any contact with the criminal not the criminal fraternity, the criminal, <laughs> the criminal legal world, because that's what most people think of as, yes. as the yes. law. So uh, anyway, I applied and I did that. I didn't do it very long because then I became a deputy high court judge. But I did. I mean, the good thing about it is, well, my husband said you bring home much more interesting stories from a day in court <laughs> after you've sat as a recorder than anything else that I've ever done. Um, and also... Uh, it's just such a weird thing to do. And also, I thought, well, every time I got through a two-week period of sitting without having made some most awful mess up, phew, and I thought, I can do anything. Bring it on. <laughs> if I can be a recorder in the Crown Court and yeah, sentence see. someone in Harrow Crown Court to five mm. years in prison, I can do anything. Nothing will scare me now. Yeah. <laughs> I think it must be quite hard. So I, I'm a commercial lawyer through and through, but to be sitting in judgment and sending people to prison. 
isn't quite tough. Yes, it is. But, you, you know, you have to be prepared to do that if you're going to get them to take the job. So, and they've usually done something pretty terrible. Um, but, yes, it is. I mean, I think the, the, the difficulty with the sitting in the Crown Court is that the, the jury is a sort of 12 individual people who have to be gradually brought along with you and to keep them all in place and to get a verdict from them. And that, I mean, even I only did cases for two or three days. I am uh, amazed at my colleagues, you know, Sir James Goss, who, who just um, presided over the Lucy Letby trial, to keep that jury oh, yes. together over that 10 months. And then for them to bring in verdicts where they were not agreed with some, they acquitted some, they, you know, so they had really clearly gone through every individual case. Yes. And that, to achieve that as a, as a judge is an extraordinary feat, I think. Um, and the thing about the jury is it's very, and the criminal court, it's very unpredictable. Every recorder's heart sinks where the usher comes in, oh, you're on a, uh, there's a note from a juror. <laughs> and this can be anything. It may herald the complete collapse of the case. Mm. It may be nothing. It may be anything in between that. But that, oh, Your Honour, we have a note from the juror, strikes fear <laughs> into the heart <laughs> of every judge, I think. Uh, makes commercial law sound very predictable. <laughs> Um, I'm going to have to skip a few questions, I, I, I'm afraid, but uh, I hope you'll pick them up in the time that you get to ask questions. Um, so can we say, okay, you are the recorder and the deputy high court judge and then uh, appointed full time to the high court. Yes. Uh, and in those roles, apart from the tribunal work, you're sitting by yourself. Yes. And then you go to the court of appeal and you're in a group of three and then Supreme Court, and you could be, you know, five, seven, whatever. Mm. Um, what were the biggest changes in that in that transition the, for how you operate? Yes. I I did like being in the High Court because I do like to be in charge. You might have gathered that already, <laughs> um, and I do find it a bit difficult not to be in charge, but I'm getting used to it. And um, yes, so there is, and there's a very different dynamic. The Supreme Court's very different because five is very different from three. Mm. And also because there are only 12 of us in the Supreme Court, whereas there are 35, 38, whatever, in the Court of Appeal, in the Supreme Court, we're all sitting with each other all the time in mm. slightly different combinations. Whereas in the Court of Appeal, you can go for you know weeks or a month and then come across someone you haven't sat with for a while. So it is a very different dynamic. It's very, I mean, the thing, when I joined the High Court, because I'd been out of the flow of um, the path that everyone else had taken, I didn't know anyone amongst the judges. I didn't know how they were going to react to me, having come from a very different background. Uh, there were some things I predicted about the job, which was it would be very challenging and intellectually interesting. Uh, what I didn't realize was how wonderful all my colleagues would be. They are such a fun bunch of people mm -hmm. um, and not at all like I feared <laughs> they might be. Um, so that was a very pleasant surprise and we all get on very well. And I think it's because in the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, you do actually sometimes, well, you do quite often disagree with each other. I mean, dissenting is much more common in the Supreme Court than it was in the, in, in the Court of Appeal. But because of that, and because you know that you have to then move on, everything is very supportive, very polite. So whenever you send round a draft judgment to the panel, everyone, oh, thank you so much for your marvellous, clear, helpful judgment, <laughs> with which I think there are these 15 <laughs> things which you need to change. But, um, mm. And at, at first, that kind of slightly spooked me because I felt, well, I really have no idea how genuine this is or how well I'm doing. Mm. But then I realised, actually, in order for everyone to 
get over the occasional tussles that we have about the result or about the reasoning. It is, it is all conducted in a very polite, very non-bitchy environment. And I, I really appreciate that because I have friends and, you know, who work in sort of horrible offices where everyone's meh, 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 and I know how <laughs> terrible and soul-destroying that is. And that has never been my experience in the judiciary. They're a great bunch of people. I certainly found that part-time. Uh, it was, you, you think as an academic that of course universities are going to be the ultimate in uh, environments where people are you know, friendly, supportive, etc. Uh, so for me, it mm. was a really pleasant surprise mm. in the mm. very part-time space. Mm. Um, so this is women in the law. Right. Uh, <laughs> we can't avoid doing this. I want to ask you three questions uh, about your role as a, as a woman judge. One about you, and then one more generally, and then one other more practical one, since you're a practical person. So first of all, about you. I mean, quite a lot of what you've said uh, makes it very plain that you've had quite a different trajectory from most people. So there you are on the Supreme Court. You're the only woman at the moment. There were more before, and I assume there'll be more afterwards. But you are the only one, and you're almost the only one with such a different background. Mm. Do you feel sort of responsible for, for making the diversity thing work just so that the practice keeps on going? I think every woman who reaches a senior position now, even now feels a bit of that responsibility not to mess it up because you are a kind of a bit of a standard bearer. Um, I don't feel that my colleagues treat me differently or I've never had any sense. And throughout my judicial career, um, I've always felt when I was in the High Court or the Court of Appeal or now, I get my fair share of the exciting cases. You might think that in the Supreme Court, every case is an exciting case. It's not, <laughs> not true. There's, there's uh, quite a lot of sort of fairly mundane work as well. But I feel I get my, I've always had my shout of the cases, the high profile cases and, and that. And I think it's, it is, um, I think I do feel that responsibility. When I started at the Supreme Court, I felt in a way, when I joined my chambers, I was the first woman ever to be taken on by those chambers. So I was the, the only woman in chambers. And that was, this was in the early 1980s. And this was a very weird time. And it was a weird thing for them. And it was a weird thing for me. And for the first six months, I just spent the whole time. This is when I was just starting out as a junior barrister thinking, oh, I mustn't say that. Would I say that if I was a man? Would they have said that to me? Um, and you can't actually live your life like that. And I've kind of let that go, and I am just me, and they have to make of it what they want. And they're all very strong personalities, as you might expect in the Supreme Court. And, um, and I don't feel... I mean, in those days, you, you got by, really, by everybody absolutely completely ignoring the fact that you were a woman. I mean, it was just never mentioned. There was nothing ever said about it um, and, it, and you, you kind of took that on for yourself as well um, but I don't feel now I have to do that I mean I it's it's always much nicer to have women colleagues and I I have three um, judicial girl chums who we meet up every few weeks for dinner and we have a good old matter and I really value that and I'm very glad that we set up that because I do miss female company, of course, but um, there it is. Someone's, someone's got to do it. <laughs> it's a bit like, yeah. yeah. So, so perhaps having, having dinners make, leads into the next question. The, the state of women in the yeah. judiciary. So uh, certainly in Cambridge and especially at Trinity, we were very pleased when Sue Carr was made the first woman uh, Lord Chief yes. Justice, because she had been a student at Trinity. Yes, uh, well, I think that's, that's a kind of a good... I think the state of women can be 
Sue is a good exemplar of that because, yes, she is shortly going to be sworn in. In the 750-year history of this role, she will be the first woman Lord Chief Justice. And the Times newspaper article record, reporting this opened, Dame Sue Carr, mother of three, <laughs> is going to be appointed. Right, so amongst the senior judiciary sisterhood, which is a close-knit and loving band of women, there was a lot of discussion. What do we make of this Dame Sue Carr, mother of three, goodness me? So you can... You can either think, oh, really, even now women are all defined in their family role and their caring responsibilities, and haven't we got past that? And I'm sure when Ian Burnett was appointed, they didn't say <laughs> Sir Ian Burnett father. I have no idea how many children Ian has, but <laughs> I'm sure that was not what they said. But on the other hand, the fact that Dame Sue has got to where she has and brought up three yes. children, one of whom got a first at Unum, um, was an enormous achievement because of what I was describing, because yeah. the professions, I'm afraid, have made very little adaptation in order to facilitate women getting ahead in, the career, in their careers. When I joined, um, when I qualified for the bar, which is in 1984, it was already half men, half women qualifying, and everyone thought, well, 10 years' time, it'll be half the, half the silks will be women. 20 years' time, it'll be half the judges will be women. And that has absolutely not happened. Mm. So in a way, I think, well, yes, it is a sign of her extraordinary achievement that she is Dame Sue Carr, mother of three, about mm. to be appointed to, the Lord, uh, to be Lord Chief Justice. But there's, I mean, I, I don't know whether that's getting any better. Um, so if I you suspect could do that it's one thing. Well, I I think that um, I think that it, this opening up of the pool of um, people who can qualify is very important, and I think that what would make a big difference would be if more solicitors could make their way to the senior judiciary. And what strikes me is that whereas sets of chambers regard it as a great honour if one of their senior members becomes a deputy high court judge, becomes a recorder, and although it makes a dent in the chamber's income for them to take six weeks out to do this judging malarkey, they still regard it as very good. Whereas I don't think firms of solicitors either have any policy about encouraging partners um, to do that or make it uh, available to people. And I think that if, if, if uh, the senior people in solicitors' firms, I know in the government legal service they're making steps towards this, or in any big organisation which employs lawyers, if they encouraged people by uh, allowing them the time to do it, by allowing them to take mentoring opportunities, then I think that is a big cadre of women in very demanding legal positions who would, would be very um, good judges um, at whatever level, and then one wouldn't be so dependent on the small number of women who actually fight their way to the top of, uh, top of the bar. I don't mean told. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so you could all do something. Yes, yes. You can. Um, I could keep on going, but I must <laughs> give you a turn. Okay, before we close, this has all been very serious and we've <laughs> traversed all sorts of interesting things. Five quick questions. Okay. You said you're good at making decisions oh, quickly. Yes. <laughs> City or country? City. Theatre or concert? Theatre. Hearing cases or writing judgments? Hearing cases. I thought that would be the <laughs> truth. Novel or a box set? Oh, that's difficult. Can I have one of both? <laughs> This is not no, I, do, I do, yes, I do. After a, uh, my, by the time I get to about 9.30 at night, after a long day, my brain is a bit frazzled, so I do, like, I do watch Box quite it. a bit of television. And then I gather you're going to Newnham tonight. Yeah. Port or claret? Claret. Champagne, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so. I 
I didn't even have to ask you to say thank you. Uh, I hope you've really enjoyed this as much as I have, and you've had a peep into Vivian's absolutely astonishing and varied career. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here with you and with you, Vivian. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you all.